Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Wednesday, August 19th. Today is the day the Lutheran Church commemorates the life of Bernard of Clairvaux, hymn writer and theologian. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun, and we look to the evening light. We sing to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Our New Testament reading tonight is from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, is it, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. And tonight we commemorate the life of Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a leader in Christian Europe in the first half of the 12th century AD. Bernard is honored in his native France and around the world. Born into a noble family in Burgundy in 1090, Bernard left the affluence of his heritage and entered the monastery of Citao at the age of 22. After two years, he was sent to start a new monastic house at Clairvaux. His work there was blessed in many ways. The monastery at Clairvaux grew in mission and service, eventually establishing some 68 daughter houses. 
Bernard is remembered not only for his charity and political abilities, but especially for his preaching and hymn composition. The hymn texts, O Jesus, King Most Wonderful, and O Sacred Head Now Wounded, are part of the heritage of the faith left by St. Bernard. Our Book of Concord reading tonight is a continuation of our reading of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, Article 4, on Justification. This is Part 3 of 6. If you are following along at bookofconcord.org or in your own copy, uh, we begin in Article 4, Paragraph 36. Lastly, it was very foolish for the adversaries to write that people who are under eternal wrath merit forgiveness of sins by an act of love which springs from their mind. For it is impossible to love God unless forgiveness of sins is received first by faith. The heart, truly feeling that God is angry, cannot love God unless he is shown to have been reconciled. As long as he terrifies us and seems to cast us into eternal death, human nature is not able to take courage. It cannot love a wrathful, judging, and punishing God. It is easy for idle men to invent such dreams about love, such as a person guilty of mortal sin can love God above all things, because they do not feel what God's wrath or judgment is. But in agony of conscience and in conflicts with Satan, conscience experiences the emptiness of those philosophical speculations. Paul says in Romans 4.15, the law brings wrath. He does not say that by the law people merit forgiveness of sins, for the law always accuses and terrifies consciences. Therefore it does not justify, because a conscience terrified by the law runs from God's judgment. They err who assume that by the law, by their own works, they merit forgiveness of sins. It is enough for us to have said these things about the righteousness of reason or of the law, which the adversaries teach. Later, when we will declare our belief about the righteousness of faith, the subject itself will drive us to present more testimonies. These also will be of service in overthrowing the adversaries' errors that we have reviewed so far. By their own strength, people cannot fulfill God's law. They are all under sin, subject to eternal wrath and death. Because of this, we cannot be freed by the law from sin and be justified. But the promise of forgiveness of sins and of justification has been given us for Christ's sake, who was given for us in order that he might make satisfaction for the sins of the world. He has been appointed as the mediator and atoning sacrifice. This promise does not depend on our merits, but freely offers forgiveness of sins and justification, as Paul says in Romans 11.6. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. And in another place, Romans 3.21, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. In other words, forgiveness of sins is freely offered, nor does reconciliation depend on our merits. Because if forgiveness of sins were to depend on our merits and reconciliation were from the law, it would be useless. Since we do not fulfill the law, it would also follow that we would never gain the promise of reconciliation. Paul reasons this way in Romans 4.14. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. If the promise would depend on our merits and the law, which we never fulfill, it would follow that the promise would be useless. Since justification is gained through the free promise, it follows that we cannot justify ourselves. Otherwise, why would there be a need to promise? Since the promise can only be received by faith, the gospel, which is properly the promise of forgiveness of sins and of justification for Christ's sake, proclaims the righteousness of faith in Christ. The law does not teach this, nor is this the righteousness of the law. For the law demands our works and our perfection. But for Christ's sake, the gospel freely offers reconciliation to us, who have been vanquished by sin and death. This is received not by works, but by faith alone. This faith does not bring to God confidence in one's own merits, but only confidence in the promise, or the mercy promised in Christ. This special faith, by which an individual believes that for Christ's sake his sins are forgiven him, and that for Christ's sake God is reconciled and sees us favorably, gains forgiveness of sins and justifies us. In repentance, namely in terrors, this faith comforts and encourages hearts. It regenerates us and brings the Holy Spirit, 
so that we may be able to fulfill God's law, to love God, truly fear God, truly be confident that God hears prayer, and obey God in all afflictions. This faith puts to death concupiscence and the like. So faith freely receives forgiveness of sins. It sets Christ, the mediator and atoning sacrifice, against God's wrath. It does not present our merits or our love. This faith is the true knowledge of Christ and helps itself to the benefits of Christ. This faith regenerates hearts and comes before the fulfilling of the law. Not a syllable exists about this faith in the teaching of our adversaries. Therefore, we find equal fault with the adversaries because a. they teach only the righteousness of the law, and b. they do not teach the righteousness of the gospel, which proclaims the righteousness of faith in Christ. What is justifying faith? Editor's Note. No other article in the Book of Concord so thoroughly presents how the Roman Church errs when it comes to the central teaching of Scripture. The Pontifical Confutation stated adamantly that justification is not by faith alone, which some incorrectly teach, but faith which works through love. This view was affirmed by the Council of Trent and remains the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church to this day. The Council of Trent condemns the Bible's teaching that man is saved apart from any works, by grace alone, through faith alone. This condemnation is still clearly evident in the most recent edition of the Catholic Catechism. What is justifying faith? The adversaries imagine that faith is only a knowledge of the history of Christ. Therefore they teach that it can coexist with mortal sin. They say nothing about faith by which Paul so frequently says that people are justified. For those who are counted as righteous before God do not live in mortal sin. But the faith that justifies is not merely a knowledge of history. It is to believe in God's promise. In the promise, for Christ's sake, forgiveness of sins and justification are freely offered. And so that no one may suppose that this is mere knowledge. We will add further. It is to want and to receive the offered promise of forgiveness of sins and of justification. The difference between this faith and the righteousness of the law can easily be discerned. Faith is the divine service, latria, that receives the benefits offered by God. The righteousness of the law is the divine service, latria, that offers to God our merits. God wants to be worshipped through faith so that we receive from him those things he promises and offers. Faith means not only a knowledge of the history, but the kind of faith that believes in the promise. And just pause really briefly right there. Uh, That is a very concrete and clear statement of why uh, we go to church. We go to the divine service to receive the gifts of God and then to repeat back to God the words that he has given us. So we don't go to church for God's benefit. God has us come to church for our benefit which is where we receive the benefit of Christ's death and resurrection for us through the divine service, through the means of grace. God wants to be worshipped through faith so that we receive from him those things he promises and offers. Faith means not only a knowledge of the history, but the kind of faith that believes in the promise. Paul plainly testifies about this when he says in Romans 4.16, That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed. He judges that the promise cannot be received unless it comes through faith. Therefore, he puts them together as things that belong to one another. He connects the promise and faith. It will be easy to decide what faith is if we consider the creed, where this article certainly stands, the forgiveness of sins. It is not enough to believe that Christ was born, suffered, was raised again, unless we add also this article, which is the purpose of the history, the forgiveness of sins. To this article, the rest must be referred, namely, that for Christ's sake, and not because of our merits, forgiveness of sins is given to us. For what need was there that Christ was given for our sins if our merits can make satisfaction for our sins? Whenever we speak of justifying faith, we must keep in mind that these three objects belong together, the promise, grace, and Christ's merits as the price and atonement. The promise is received through faith. Grace excludes our merits and means that the benefit is offered only through mercy. Christ's merits are the price, 
because there must be a certain atonement for our sins. Scripture frequently cries out for mercy. The Holy Fathers often say that we are saved by mercy. Therefore, whenever mercy is mentioned, we must keep in mind that faith which receives the promise of mercy is required there. Again, whenever we speak about faith, we want an object of faith to be understood, namely the promised mercy. For faith justifies and saves, not only because it is a worthy work in itself, but only because it receives the promised mercy. And we conclude there for this evening, and we will pick up with our fourth section tomorrow evening. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare all the dying. From all sin, from all evil, from the devil's might, from the devil's wiles, from your wrath and from hell's torment, from sudden and evil death, good Lord, deliver them. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the grace of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, help them, good Lord. In the hour of death, on the day of judgment, help them, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. To comfort all the dying, to forgive them all their sins, to lead them out of this misery into eternal life, we implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. O God, enkindled with the fire of your love, your servant Bernard of Clairvaux became a burning and shining light in your church. By your mercy, grant that we also may be aflame with the spirit of your love and discipline, and may ever walk in your presence as children of light. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.